Hi, and welcome back to episode 5 of my ongoing series, Attack of the Rhetoric. My name is Bob, and I like to use the Star Wars movie saga as a platform for exploring history, literature, and philosophy. Today I'd like to talk about my favorite subject, the Sith. Now the word Sith never actually appears in the original Star Wars trilogy, a phenomenon that could be worthy of an entire discussion of its own. But the word does figure prominently in the prequel trilogy, and like the Jedi, the word is left a tantalizing mystery. The definition that exists within the fictional universe is supplied here by Wikipedia. The word Sith may have been inspired by a breed of Celtic fairy known as the Babanshi or Kushi. While a minor mispronunciation, it's not much of a stretch considering Lucas draws heavily on Irish folk heroes, including the Tuatha de Danann, in his epic and, can I just say, underappreciated fairy tale, Willow. Or, if you don't like that idea, it's possible the name was inspired by the son of Greek god Poseidon, Sithon. There's a region in modern-day Greece named after him called Sithonia, where according to legend, a race of giants from Greek mythology destroyed each other by throwing boulders at the gods. This could go away as in expressing why there can only be a master and apprentice. Otherwise, the Sith would expend all their energy fighting amongst themselves like a cluster of two-headed soccer hooligans. Speaking of the Greeks, the Jedi seem to embody Plato's concept of philosopher kings. Until philosophers are kings, or the kings and princes of this world have the spirit and power of philosophy, and political greatness and wisdom meet in one, and those commoner natures who pursue either to the exclusion of the other are compelled to stand aside, cities will never have rest from their evils. The Sith, on the other hand, to me are better represented by Friedrich Nietzsche's Hyperboreans. Nietzsche a 19th century German philosopher and dark lord of the mustache, is famous for challenging the foundations of Christianity and tr traditional morality. Nietzsche took this name Hyperborean from Greek mythology. It's the name of the superior beings that live in a utopia beyond the north winds, home of the Ubermensch who is unfettered by morality. In Nietzsche's Twilight of the Idols, he calls for the gods of society, in this case the Jedi, to step down and let humanity, the Sith, act out their Darwinian struggles unabashed. Morality is simply petrified violence, a conditioned response that we must learn to overcome. Only those too weak for competition preach passiveness. It is not wrong to seek dominion over people or the world itself. No one personifies this will to power better than the Emperor himself. Nietzsche was trying to instill a feeling of self-improvement and discipline, but also he says that it's natural for man to seek dominion over his environment that throughout classical history, it was not looked down upon for men to fight and argue their way to the top. Seeking power is an innate driving force in humankind, one that should not be repressed because it compels us to excel. He lamented that now, in the age of democracies, even our leaders are nothing more than servants or slaves of the people, and the people are weak and stupid. To his mind, such a government, or possibly inner government, is a crime against nature, or in this case, the force. I do think that Palpatine would agree with Nietzsche because to Palpatine's mind, he is very disciplined and wise. Star Wars asks us to see two different views of both Sith and Jedi. We get the Jedi's view of the Sith and the Sith's view of the Jedi. The question is, who should we believe? He shall be greatest who can be loneliest, the most concealed, the most deviant, the human being beyond good and evil, the master of his virtues, he that is over rich in will. Sidious's name demonstrates plotting and patience, and brings to mind that extreme subtlety called for by Sun Tzu in The Art of War, especially the phrase, win first, fight later. Also, Lao Tzu of the Tao Te Ching says that the ruler should be a shadowy presence to his subjects, and that only the truly selfish man is fit to rule. There's plenty more to be said about the two Tzus, but I think we'll save that for another video. For now, I'd like to make a brief note on Darth Maul and Tyrannus. Now, there's virtually no background within the movies for Darth Maul. That being the case, I don't feel bad making observations based on his appearance. This is one hardcore badass. Tattooed all over, he's given himself to the dark side. It's fairly obvious Maul represents a demonic character, but what are his motivations? I think Baudelaire summed up the Sith, and especially Maul, when he wrote about Satan, O first of exiles who endurest wrong, yet growest in thy hatred still more strong. Maul seems to have been raised by Darth Sidious, trained from a young age, so I imagine that his hatred for the Jedi is due largely from his upbringing. 
If he had been rescued at an earlier age, he might have been a great self-help guru. But, like Robin, he was merely acting out a series of behaviors instilled in him at an early age. This being the case, I am tempted to regard him as a more of a tragic figure than a villainous one. All the better so that he doesn't undermine the menace of the Phantom. And it makes him a clever contrast to Darth Tyrannus. Are Maul and Tyrannus opposites in their age, but also in their convictions? While one could write volumes on the handsome devil, ugly demon trope, Tyrannus is an oddity in Star Wars in that, unlike the other Sith, or the villains in general, he is not scarred, deformed, or mutilated. Unlike Maul, Tyrannus was once a Jedi. He has become disgruntled by what we don't know, but his age, social status, and disenfranchisement make him the ideal Separatist leader. I see Tyrannus as the incarnation of Machiavelli's prince, the leader who must enter into evil to bring about a greater society. Dooku believes the Republic has fallen apart and changes have to be made. Keep in mind that we don't know how much of his motivations he actually shared with Darth Sidious. He knows that more talking will not achieve anything, and that you've got to get senators by the balls in order to make their heads and hearts follow. The clue to this thematically is that he doesn't look evil. Generally, not always, but generally, Lucas shows his villains as unmistakably bad. Who questioned the evil of Darth Vader when he first stepped aboard the blockade runner? Yet, Tyrannus, while aged, is quite dapper and sophisticated. That hints to me that he's not meant to be evil, but only entering into evil in order to save the Republic from itself. Padme even seems to share his view in Episode 3 when she suggests, sounding like a Separatist, that she and Anakin are possibly on the wrong side. This brings some much-needed grayness to the otherwise black-and-white storyline. Judging by Anakin's little naming ceremony, I have to assume that Tyrannus was a name given to Dooku by Sidious, thus hinting at what he had planned for him. Yet, strangely, Tyrannus is known almost exclusively throughout the films as Count Dooku. It would seem to me uh, that the Sith believed the Republic was doomed to fall, and where it would land was just as certain. American statesman and fellow lightning enthusiast Benjamin Franklin wrote, The American government can only end in despotism as other forms have done it, when the people shall become so corrupted as to need despotic government being incapable of any other. Count Dooku was a political idealist. Fuck. Count Dooku was a political idealist, a man who felt drastic mag... Son of a bitch! Count Dooku was a political idealist, a man who felt drastic measures needed to be taken. His means are difficult to justify since we don't know what his ends would have been, but I have portrayed Dooku as a Machiavellian, so I turned to Machiavelli to explain why Dooku might have felt the Republic needed to fall. In The Prince, Machiavelli refers to the turning of the historical wheel, a cycle that individuals and entire societies frequently, if not necessarily, fall into. Virtue breeds quiet, quiet indolence, indolence disorder, disorder ruin, and similarly out of ruin, order is born. From order, virtue. Out of this, glory and good fortune. 18th century Genevan philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau was thinking along similar lines when he wrote in The Social Contract, There are indeed times in the history of states when, just as some kinds of illness turn men's heads and make them forget the past, Periods of violence and revolutions due to peoples with these crises due to individuals. Horror of the past takes the place of forgetfulness, and the state, set on fire by civil wars, is born again, so to speak, from its ashes, and takes on anew, fresh from the jaws of death, the vigor of youth. Adult diapers aside, Dooku seems to be trusting in the hope that after the war, where the greedy and squabbling politicians have been purged, peace and prosperity will return to the Republic. Palpatine drastically understates the problem when he says the Republic is not what it once was. Based on the esteem of the Jedi, the Republic had once been a shining beacon of freedom and equality, but is now little more than a gilded veneer of its former glory and good fortune. History is fraught with examples of idealistic governments that wound up worse off for clinging to their illusions. Suffering from a similar disillusionment by his own society, Anglo-Irish satirist Jonathan Swift writes in Gulliver's Travels, 
that laws are best explained, interpreted, and applied by those whose interests and abilities lie in perverting, confounding, and eluding them. I observe among you some lines of an institution which in its original might have been tolerable, but these half erased and the rest wholly blurred and blotted by corruptions. In his great classic work, The Republic, Plato expounds what he sees as four imperfect forms of government, timarchy, oligarchy, democracy, and tyranny. The man who lives in a democracy reckons his way of living as pleasant, free, and happy, who believes in liberty and equality. But democracy is flawed in that liberty is its objective, yet an excessive desire for liberty at the expense of everything else is what undermines democracy and leads to the demand for tyranny. A democratic society, in its thirst for liberty, may fall under the influence of bad leaders. Like many viruses, Palpatine was an opportunist. The fictional course of the Galactic Republic was following a long-recognized and tragic pattern that many real-world governments fall into that has little to do with the incidental influence of any particular leaders. Historian Jared Diamond writes in his Pulitzer Prize-winning book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, it remains an open question how wide and lasting the effects of idiosyncratic individuals on history really are. The Sith had been patiently waiting for the time when the Republic was weak from corruption, a time they knew would inevitably come. Then, with or without the Sith, the Republic was doomed to fall. But, like the phoenix, it was bound to rise from its own ashes. In an attempt to preserve all it once stood for, the Republic destroyed itself. So I leave you with words from our old friend Anthony Burgess, who sums up the issue rather succinctly. They will sell liberty for a quieter life. Thanks for watching.